see that uh, our friends at Liberia have joined us. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, welcome uh, to the evening uh, session. So this evening, I want to talk with you about, uh, uh, as we've uh, mentioned, this whole day on the supernatural. This evening, I want to talk with you about supernatural vision. So we've talked about supernatural churches. We've talked about supernatural harvesting. And now I want to talk with you this evening about having supernatural vision. I want to share the story with you of how God took Paul uh, from Antioch all the way to Philippi. And it's a fascinating story of how that happened. Uh, it is, uh, we always need the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us in when it comes to sharing our faith and doing supernatural harvesting. So let me uh, share the PowerPoint with you one more time and I'll be up in the corner and uh, you can see me there as we uh, work together and understanding this moment. Just let me launch the PowerPoint. There we go. So we want to follow the Spirit's leading. Our topic this evening is the gospel in Philippi and supernatural vision where Paul had a dream at night and a man said, come over and help us. Acts chapter 16 and verse 9. Now, to reach that point, Paul had to have a lot of faith and trust in following the leading of the Holy Spirit. And let me just show you this journey. So we begin up here in the city of of Antioch. This is now the second missionary journey, and we're going to trace Paul's journey from Antioch, uh, from Antioch in Syria to Antioch in Pisidia, and eventually over into Macedonia. And how the all the things that happened along the way, let me just share a little bit about that story. So this is the Taurus Mountain. It's outside of Tarsus. They walked up uh, from Antioch in, in Syria to Tarsus, his hometown. This is Paul's hometown. He had to cross a lot of rivers. This is one of those rivers. Remember, Paul said, I was in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers at night, dangers in the day, dangers from animals. We know there's all sorts of obstacles that we have to overcome. And this is the actual Roman road that Paul walked up with his team. You see far in the distance, these snow-capped mountains, he had to walk up through the Cilician gates to get up into the plateau of Turkey so he could begin to make his way up, way up into where God was taking him. And so after you go through the pass, you can see uh, this narrow pass through here, and there's a mountain. There's the, at the bottom of the picture, you can see the highway going through that mountain. Back in those days, it was very dangerous. Robbers were up in there in that place, armies wouldn't go through there. It was just too dangerous. But once you get up on the plateau, the central Anatolian plateau, you can decide which valley to go down uh, to reach the city that you want to reach. Look how long that train is and look how flat it is. And of course, the first city he came to, uh, the way he stopped and had ministry was Derby. This was the last city of the first missionary journey. Now Paul is returning to Derby. And uh, he preached there the gospel to that city in the first journey and made many disciples, Acts chapter 14 and verse 21. And so here uh, he's returning to the many disciples uh, to begin reaching people. And we read that on the second missionary journey, Gaius joined Paul's team. This is where that ancient city is found. We know it's there because we've found a stone uh, with the name of the Bishop of Gaius. And so we know that that is the ancient city. It's still in ruins right now. From there, they moved on to Lystra. These are the ruins of Lystra. And again, we know from archaeology, that's where it was. And this is where the crippled man from birth who had never walked was healed by Paul on the first missionary journey. Remember, they began to worship him. Bring garlands. These are the gods have come down. And Paul said, no, the gods didn't come down. God is in me. <laughs> and he released the power. And so again, somebody listening to this conference, you are crippled, you're crippled from birth, you have a deformity. I command your leg to straighten out now in the name of Jesus and walk, get up and walk, get up and run around that room if that's you. Maybe it'll be somebody listening later, but if that's you, we speak healing over you. 
your legs right now. In Jesus' name, I hear somebody shouting in the background, and I love it. Paul said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking, Acts chapter 14 and verse 10. Now, this is the home of Timothy, and this is where he found Timothy. Before I talk about Timothy, let me just tell you about Jacinta. Isn't this a beautiful-looking African lady? Full mm -hmm. of smiles, full of the Holy Spirit. But her life was not always that way. She's from Kenya. She's living in, in, in Spain right now. But let me tell you how I met her. This is how I met her. And not in this picture, but inside the airport. She is outside of the airport saying goodbye to friends because of problems with her legs. Problems in particular with uh, her hip and her spine. And, uh, and so she has come to Spain from Spain, where two doctors have it said, you'll never walk again. And her family said, come and see these physicians in uh, Nairobi who are doing some special things with oxygen. They'll be able to help you. And here, these two physicians in Nairobi said, you'll never walk again. We can't help you. Here she is saying goodbye. And they let her, released her there, and she was pushed into the waiting room and put directly in front of me at midnight in the airport in Nairobi. And I, I just want to say to you that uh, I'm going to just, uh, uh, well, I, I just want to say to you, I, <laughs> she, when she sat there, I said, Lord, I'm tired. I've done two weeks of ministry. I, I don't see anybody. And now that's mm -hmm. just being honest with you. But the Lord saw her and saw in her what I didn't see in her. And the Lord kept working on me. I said, he said, I put her in front of you. What are you going to do about it? I said, Lord, I'm tired. I looked down at her tickets were in her hand. I'm just being honest with you. And her ticket, she had a seat next to me in the airplane. I said, God, that's not fair. <laughs> he said, well, what are you going to do about it? So I offered her coffee and tea and snacks because it was late at night. She couldn't help herself. By this time, she had a brace on her leg, and her leg was sticking straight out. I began to talk to her, and I mm. prayed for her. I prayed for God to touch her. I didn't know, but the moment I prayed for her, she felt something in her leg. Hey. Yes, Lord. Absolutely. We get on the airplane. I was with a friend. We happened to change seats, so he was sitting next to her. He came over to me and said, that lady wants to know. When are you going to come pray for her again? So I changed seats. He said, she's in the restroom. Well, she went in the restroom to take a morphine shot because she was in so much pain. We prayed for her. We parted in London. She went to Spain. And then I came back on to America. My phone kept ringing. Turned out it was this lady. She said, Dr. McLuhan, three weeks after you prayed for me, I got out of my wheelchair and I walked. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Now, this is an old story, and I like to tell stories of people that I've known for a long time, that they're verifiable stories. You can go visit your center. The doctor said, you will have no children. She conceived and had a child. Then she had twins. Here's a lady who's told, you'll never walk, you'll never have children, and the power of the Holy Spirit late night in an airport when I didn't want to pray and she hardly believed in prayer anymore. God worked in her life. Amen. So when I prayed a few moments ago, if you're crippled to you get up and walk, I knew what I was talking about. I know I have experience of the power of God flowing through my life. And I want to encourage you to trust God. Believe him for healing, for miraculous Amen. healing, for people who've told you will never be well. In Jesus' name, we release the power of Holy Spirit healing. And so it's, this all begins from this first missionary journey at Lystra when Paul raised that man uh, who had never walked. They stoned him, and then God raised him from the dead. He's a living testimony to what Jesus said. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, cast out demons, raise the dead, and heal uh, terminal diseases. Thank you, Lord. And so Timothy joined Paul's team. From there, they moved on to Antioch and Iconium, and they remained there a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done through their hands, the whole team's hands, not just Paul's hands, but the whole team. 
and Acts 14 and verse 3, and I just released to you signs and wonders to flow through your hands, people that you touch. And people say, let's see what your God can do. Show people what your God can do by releasing signs and wonders in the lives of people. From there, they traveled to Iconium. And this is where that second missionary journey had its critical turning point at Pisidian Antioch. They passed these beautiful sites and came back to Pisidian Antioch. The first time they went there, the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of God. And I release upon you an anointing that calls an entire city, entire village, entire town to come and to hear the word of God. And the word of the Lord was spreading rapidly through the whole region, Acts chapter 13 and verse 49. We are retracing backwards the first missionary journey, recalling what God did in the past. And when we remember what God did in the past, we open the door for God to do it again. And I'm asking God to do it again through me and through you and through all of us. This is a city where they worship the living emperor as God. This was the temple to, to uh, Oct Octavian, uh, uh, or Caesar Augustus, the first one who was actually worshipped as a god. So it's in that place now that Paul doesn't know which way to go, to the left or to the right. This is the leading of the Holy Spirit. I know this is a long introduction, but I want you to understand the price Paul paid to have supernatural vision. Uh, first of all, Paul wanted to go. Do you see that arrow I just put up there? He wanted to go to the town of Ephesus. This was the capital. Paul's goal was to be in the biggest town in front of the highest official to give a witness for Jesus. But we have these interesting words in Acts chapter 16. They passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region. Listen, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Now, that's an unusual word. And I just want to say to you, there are times to talk and times not to talk. You need the leading of the Holy Spirit. And in this case, God said, you can go to Ephesus if you want, but you can't preach. And Paul can't go where he can't preach. There must be some other place. There's a timing. Now, God was very interested in the city of Ephesus, but Paul was not ready. And sometimes we have a vision that's greater than our team is capable of carrying. And Paul himself did not have enough experience to go to Ephesus. And God said, I don't want you to go there now. Sometime in the future, but not right now. And when God says no to one door, he'll open another way. And so they went on. Now this time to Doralaim. You see up here, I put it uh, in the circle. This is the town of Doralaim. So they go. They don't go to, An to Ephesus. They go back to, uh, from Antioch. They go up on to Doralaim. And then Paul wants to go into this region referred to as Bithynia. And after they came to Mycenae, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. Now, sometimes, dear friends, pastors, listen to me. You learn what God doesn't want you to do before you learn what God wants you to do. Don't be mad at God. He's helping you discover where you belong and what your purpose is. This is Doralaim. This is Eskashur. This is a huge town in Turkey. That's where Paul wanted to go. And the Holy Spirit said, it's not for you. That's not the region where I want you to work. I know you see it. I know it looks good. And I know you think there's a big opportunity, but it's not for you to go there. Look, I want you to see that God let me go there. This is the city hall in this town. Remember, it's Turkish people, Muslims. And these are all Iranians, people who've come out of Iran as refugees. They went to the city officials and said, we need a place to worship God. Where can we worship? They gave them the town hall where Paul was forbidden to preach. And in that town, I preached uh, a message. And Iranians came to know Jesus. People and lives were touched. What a story. Uh, so Paul was not allowed to go to Bithynia. So he took the, this whole region. And I'll tell you why Paul was not allowed to go there, because that was where Peter would eventually go. You look at those names up there, Bithynia, Cappadocia. That's all the territory that Peter is in. In 1 Peter chapter 1, if you read the names of the towns, that's the territory that Peter was sent to minister in. It became known as Nicaea. And this is where the council met. These are students of mine from North Africa. I'm teaching at a school in Turkey. We visited where the 
Council of Nicaea was held, the Nicaean Creed. Here's an uh, Iranian couple that have suffered terribly. He's been in the worst prison in Iran. I ministered to him. This is the street that the Apostle Peter walked on. Well, wow, what a blessing. And so when they found out where they weren't supposed to go, then they found where they were supposed to go. After coming to Mycenae, they were trying to go to Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. But passing through Mycenae, they came down to Troas, Acts chapter 16 and verse 8. And so there they are. Do you see this arrow in the top here? This is where Troas is. Now, they left from Antioch on the second missionary journey. Listen to Pastor Peter. Paul and his team walked 1,000 kilometers before they figured out where God wanted them to be in Troas. It's a lot of patience, a lot of time, a lot of effort. And if you haven't figured out where you're supposed to go next week, it's okay. God will get you where you need to be. Just be patient. Go with him, and he will lead you every step of the way. So they came to Alexandria and Troas. And it's, this is sunset at Troas. Uh, I've had the privilege of visiting almost every place the Apostle Paul was taken. God has taken me on these amazing journeys to see where Paul walked, to see where he ministered, to see how people's lives were touched. And that night he had a vision and he received a supernatural call to a place called Macedonia. A vision appeared to Paul in the night of a man of Macedonia standing and appealing to him saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Acts chapter 16 and verse nine. I just want to say to you, ask God to talk to you. Ask God to talk to you right now. You're going to have a vision of somebody you're going to see as you leave this conference. Ask God to show you the name or the face of a person that you're going to meet. L listen to me. Ask God right now to show you the face of some person, some area, some village, somebody who's saying, come help me. Please, somebody come help me. This uh, religion that I follow hasn't helped me. This Islam hasn't helped me. This uh, animism hasn't helped me. This Buddhism hasn't helped me. This Hinduism hasn't helped me. I'm lost. This atheism hasn't helped me. Somebody come and help me. And God will lead you to that person. And then pastors and network partners are going to listen to this message long after it's been recorded. Ask God to sh give you a picture of a man or a woman standing who is desperate for the message that you carry. That's a supernatural vision. And God is showing I've, every time I've done this, somebody has said, I see somebody. And they write to me and say, I left the conference on the way home. He was on the bus. She was on the bus. Uh, she was in the taxi. He was on the taxi. He was on the street. And I went up to him. And I shared the message with him. <laughs> and I'm getting a little bit excited tonight. May God help you to have supernatural vision. So Paul determined immediately in the spirit. It was time to leave Turkey and go to Greece. This is the first time the gospel is coming into Greece. It's a most remarkable area. This big circle I put up in the top here. This is the region of Mac Macedonia. And Philippi is the leading city. So they left Troas, that's the old Roman harbor that was built uh, in the first century. These are the ruins of that harbor. They put to sea, they came to Samothrace the following day to Neapolis. And this is the road leading into Philippi called the Ignatian Way. Now that's a picture of me when I was a young man, a little more woolly, a little more hair, a little skinnier than I am today. But that's the actual road the apostle Paul walked on, looking for the man of, for Macedonia that God sent him to find. This is the city of Philippi in ruins today. Uh, Philippi was founded by Alexander the Great's father who mined in that mountain behind there for, co for gold. And I was there on a Sunday morning and, and the guide uh, said as we were driving around, who would like to preach in Philippi? And I said, I'd love to. I had no idea it was Sunday morning that we would be there. And there I am on a Sunday morning preaching in the city of Philippi. And part of that message I preached there, I'll share with you right now. Well, when you go to a city where there is absolutely no, no, no synagogue, 
no knowledge of the great God of the Old Testament, no knowledge of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, no knowledge of Noah, no knowledge of Abraham. Where do you start? Well, this is what they did. They went to the river. On the Sabbath day, we went to the gate of the riverside where we supposed there would be a place of prayer. They sat down and spoke to the woman who had come together. People go to rivers to get clean. People go to rivers for personal, humanitarian, uh, um, sanitation reasons, but people go to rivers to wash. They wash their clothes. And they went to the river to find people who were washing. Now look, all the great rivers of the world, people go there to wash not just their clothes, but to try to wash their souls that somehow the water would clean the inside. But water never cleans the inside. It only cleans the outside. And this prayer that was going on was not prayer to Jesus. It was not prayer to Jehovah God. It was prayer to the gods. These are Greek people. It was prayers to Zeus and to Bacchus and to um, the whole pantheon. Don't need to talk about it. It doesn't mean much in Africa. But the prayer to false gods. And they went to see what God would do. Somebody is trying to talk to God. That means they want to connect with someone larger and greater than them. And we urge you to go to the places where people are trying in their pagan ways to connect with God. So Paul went there. They went to the river. This is the river where they went to. And one of us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple mm. goods who was a worshiper of God. She was the woman of peace. She was the one that Paul was looking for in terms of what Jesus said. She's not the man from Macedonia, but she is the woman of peace who will open the city for her. Uh, she is from Thyatira, one of the cities, seven churches of Revelation from, uh, from Turkey. But here she is selling purple. Now purple was the, the fabric of royalty and there were just a few drops of this dye from these shells uh, that were found, these onyx shells. And from those shells, they extracted that dye, made this very expensive fabric. This was a lady of influence. And I just want to say that the church, uh, the, the place to begin is not with the poor. Churches should have compassion for the poor. But ask God to introduce you, to bring you in contact with people of means and influence who can change a culture. Paul's goal was to stand in front of the highest official and preach the gospel. And uh, we can do humanitarian work, but cultures are changed from the top down, not yeah, right. bottom up. And may God give you a vision to, we, we have a bad tendency to witness to people of a so, lower socioeconomic status than we have. May God give you the courage to witness up Witness to people with more education than you have. Witness to people with more money than you have. Witness to people with uh, more status than you have. You have status they don't have. You have resources they don't have. You have knowledge they don't have. You're not inferior. Witness up. Let the power and blood of Jesus flow through you. There are three kinds of people that Paul met in Philippi. These are types of people. I want to introduce you to the types of people. These are not, there were not just three converts, but Luke picked three people to talk to us about in the supernatural harvesting, supernatural church and supernatural vision. Ask God to show you these. The first is a tender heart. She's Lydia. This is the lady who will be the woman of peace for the city of Philippi. The Lord opened her heart to respond to the things that have been spoken by Paul. And sitting in the sound of my voice right now are people who have come to this meeting. You didn't come to the day sessions because you had work and other things to do, but you've come to this evening mission, evening service right now. God is opening your heart. He's opening your heart to hear the message that I'm preaching, the message of salvation that Paul preached. 
If your heart has just been opened, I want you to Amen. stand up right now. Just stand right where you are. Pastor, look and see who's standing in the room. You are ready to receive Jesus as your Savior because your heart has been opened right now by the Lord. I didn't open it. The Holy Spirit has opened your heart. Say, thank you, Jesus, for coming to earth, for dying for me in my place, for forgiving me for all of my sins. I receive you as my Savior right now. That is a tender and an open heart. Thank you, Lord. Pastor, if there are people that have stood, take them, just take them and, and counsel them right now in the Holy Spirit. You'll, you can still see the message afterwards, but right now, people's hearts are open. I was in Turkey preaching. Three men came from Afghanistan. They walked in the service, sat down, never been in a church. I began preaching. I said, whose heart has the Lord opened? Three men from Afghanistan stood up right there in the service gave their heart to Jesus. I was in uh, um, mm. on the far on the other side of uh, Turkey in a place called Cappadocia or Cappadocia as we think about it in the English language. And two men had come from Iran. They were oil officials. They were high uh, people. They had resisted everybody's uh, attempt to share the message of Jesus with them from a Muslim background. They came to the service and I said, whose heart has been opened right now, both of those men stood up and gave their heart to Jesus right there. Tender hearts are people who have been prepared by God. They may look resistant. They may not have any idea that they'll receive Jesus, but in the moment the Holy Spirit comes upon them, their hearts are tender. They receive the Lord. I was in another town in Turkey, and a man brought his wife to hear me. An American had come come and listen to, she had never come to church with him. He had given his heart to Jesus a long time ago, but this man had never, uh, wife had never opened her heart. And I began to share the story of Lydia and how God opened her heart. And I said, whose heart is God opening right now? And she stood up and gave her heart to Jesus. And so we invite you right now to have a tender heart towards God. And if you've never opened your heart to him, Amen to receive Jesus as your savior right now. And so we need to go with the expectation that God is going to open hearts for us to speak to. We have this idea that everybody's going to say no to the gospel. Are you sure you want to accept Jesus? <laughs> Don't do that. Just believe that their hearts that God has opened for us to share the message of Jesus with them. And you'll find that you're going to find an open heart. So that's Lydia. After she was baptized, she and her household as well, her children. She urged us saying, if you have judged me faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us, Acts chapter 16 and verse 15. You do see, she's the woman of peace. She invited Paul and the team into her home. She provided for them. There are persons of peace whose hearts are open and tender towards God that God wants you to find and go after. And so she was baptized uh, here in this uh, river that we have just seen. So Paul continues ministering in the marketplace. So the first person you're going to find uh, is, uh, is a tender heart. But the next type of person that you're going to find is somebody uh, who is uh, who is a tormented heart. And this is the fortune teller. She's demonized. Uh, she is filled with yeah, demonic enough. thoughts and influences. And they met in that market that you just saw, a slave girl having a spirit of divination, Acts chapter 16 and verse 16. You need to know about the spirit of divination. Uh, what If I ask you, what is a spirit of divination? Uh, you probably would say it's a demon, it's an evil spirit, and, and of course all of that's true. But in this case, the Greek... And Dr. Luke is extremely clear about what was possessing this girl. It's a python. It's a python spirit. It's a snake spirit. And you know that a python, well from Africa, strangles people to death. And there's some people who are being tormented and literally the life is being strangled out of them by evil spirits. But there's something even deeper about this girl. Uh, she is from the Oracle of Delphi. This is the most important psychic cent uh, center of psychic interpretation 
in all of Greece. It's called the Oracle of Delphi. And at this place, Apollo, according to the Greek tradition, killed a python and took over this place. And so Luke is telling us this is a lady trained at the most important psychic center in all of Greece. And now as a young girl, she's still, she's retired. And she's gone back to Philippi. She's done her service. People are using her and making money off of her. She's a fortune teller. And I'm just telling you that, uh, that God wants to use you to set free fortune tellers. This is what Isaiah wrote about you. Wearied yourself with many counselors. Let them stand forth and save you if they can. Those who divide the heavens and gaze in the stars and the new moons and make known to you what shall come upon you. Paul showed up in Philippi to say false prophecy is dead and my God has more power. Now he knew that if he cast that spirit out of her, all heaven would break loose. Actually, it's the other word that break loose. He knew that there would be an attack upon him. He knew what were the consequences because he would rob people of their livelihood, but he had the, he didn't worry about the power to set her free. He knew that there would be consequences. And so he, 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 he held back. She kept doing this for many days and Paul becoming greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you to come out in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her, it came wow. out at that very hour, Acts chapter 16 and verse 18. And sometimes we just need to let the Holy Spirit stir us until we can't hold it back any longer. You feel agitated by the abuse of children. You feel agitated by circumstances that are harming and hurting people. And something inside of you says, I have the answer to this problem. And we're going to set people free. So a supernatural vision will give you, help you to see past Amen. somebody who's bound up and set them free. Amen. I walked into a church and the pastor said, Amen. a godly man just walked in here and God's going to use you to reach the nations with the message of Jesus. After the service, the people who knew that man were horrified. They came up to the pastor and said, pastor, you were wrong. That man's on drugs. That man is no good. And the pastor said, I knew that. What he does, and he knows that, but what he doesn't know is what God sees in him. Amen. He was set free instantly from drugs, became a minister of God. God ask God to give you vision to see in people what God sees in people. It took great courage for that pastor to say that. And he didn't really know the man, but what he knew is what God told him. And when God tells you things about people, say it and declare it. Let the Spirit of God come upon you. Oh, hallelujah. You feeling that tonight in the Spirit? Thank you, Lord. Thank you for people who have a tender heart. Thank you, people who have a tormented heart. There's a, a third kind of person that God wants you to meet. And we go up from this conference. You go meet all three of these people in different ways and at different times. And God is preparing you to deal with them. And these are the tough hearts. Uh, these are the jailers. These are the people who want to hurt you. These are the terrorists. When they had struck many blows, they threw them into prison and commanded the jailer to guard them securely. Acts chapter 16 and verse 23. Uh, listen to pastor. Tough hearts make the best converts. Amen. Terrorists make the best converts. The apostle Paul was a terrorist. He's a great convert. And people who are, who are all in on destruction, the destruction of people and hurting people will be all in when their hearts get changed and touched by the Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid of the terrorist. God give you strength and courage to face hard times. This is the traditional site of Paul's prison. Now, I don't know whether Paul was in this place or not. What I do know is that it broke apart. And so even if that was the prison, we're close enough to where Paul was in prison. And he's worshiping in the dark. I just want to lean into this tonight because there's some people at this conference, you're going to have to worship in the dark. There's not going to be a worship team there. Your pastor's not going to be there with you. You're going to be alone with God. And uh, everybody is conspiring against you. 
and the enemy has come in to attack you, you got to worship in the dark because it is in the dark that the Holy Spirit comes through and finds where you are and begins to touch you. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Now you look at this. The rest of the prisoners were listening to them. I just want to say to you, anybody can worship on a Sunday morning with a great band, a great worship team, and you're in the church with other Christians. But it's people want to know, not does God help you on Sunday. People want to know, does God help you in the dark? <laughs> does, does your God help you when nobody else is with you? People are watching you. And sometimes God takes you through some troubling and difficult waters and you, you blame the devil. But it's not the devil. God is just letting you be a light where it's dark. Because people are watching you. Your family is watching you, not when you have money, when you have no money. Your family is watching you, not when you're healthy, but when you're sick. They want to know, what can your God do? Yeah. Paul and Silas are in prison. And the guards and the prisoners are listening to them praise God. There's some things that prayer can't help you. There's some things Bible reading can't help you. I'm not being disrespectful, but there's nothing that worship can't break. And when you can't pray, and when you can't read, you can worship. And you can let it out in the dark. Praise your God for his goodness to you. I want to tell you how the story goes down. Let, let me just stop for and stop the sharing for just a moment and just look you straight in the eye and talk to you for just a moment. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's look at Pastor Peter. There was something different about the spirit of Paul and Silas. The jailer knew there was something different. They went into that prison. They were accustomed to prisoners cursing them. They were accustomed to people spitting at them. And after that, praise and worship goes on. And that jail breaks open. The jailer wants to know, what's different about you? You could have run and you didn't. What is the force of personality that not only keeps you here, but keeps everybody who heard you sing and worship and pray? Why didn't they run? It's the anointing on Paul and Barnabas that Silas that kept people there. The jailer says, what do you have that I don't have? What do you know that I don't know? What must I do to be like you? And Paul had a chance to lead that man to Jesus. Now, I, I just want to say, this is how I believe it happened. They're in the jail, they've been beaten, and they are hurt. There's no question, they're hurting, but they make a choice. Mm -hmm. And as Paul mm -hmm. is there, he reaches to Silas in the dark. Remember, there's no light, they're in the pitch black dark. And he says, Silas, I just figured it out. Silas says, Paul, what'd you just figure out? The man from Macedonia. The man from Macedonia. When I saw that jailer, I said to myself, I've seen that face. And the man from Macedonia, the jailer is the man from Macedonia I saw back in Troas. Tonight he will know Jesus. I don't have any idea how, but tonight he will know Jesus. Amen. I tell you, Paul and Silas, so the pain left. They began worship and praising God, and all heaven broke loose into that jail. Hey. That jailer, who was the tough man, the terrorist, the tormentor, became a follower of Jesus. And he simply asked this incredibly powerful question. What do you know that I don't know? What is it that's worth fueling your life that not, that's not fueling my life? Acts chapter 16 and verse 30. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? 
Hmm. And the actual language of that is, what do I have to do to be like you? Hmm. What do you know that I don't know? What is your source of inner power that I don't have? How come you can praise in the dark and I can't even praise God in the day? Mm. <laughs> we want people to be asked what it is that they can do to be like you. And so in this very powerful story, I've lost all track of time, Pastor. I'm just being lost in the moment. <laughs> the three types of converts that God wants you to find. The tender hearts, the Lydia's, the tormented hearts, the fortune teller, and the tough hearts, the jailers, the people uh, who will be mean to you. Now, <clears throat> just so that it's very clear for you, the, there were more people saved in Philippi than just these three. And there's evidence for this in the scripture. You know that they were asked to leave and asked to go out, leave the city. And Paul said, no, no, you beat us. You can come and escort us out. So they went out of the prison, Acts chapter 16 and verse 40. I'm not projecting it. I'm just saying it to you right now. They visited Lydia. Yeah. And when they had seen the brothers, they departed and encouraged them. And then they departed, Acts chapter 16, verse 40. So you can check that reference out and see if uh, Pastor Peter is correct. And so they joined and they visited all the other brothers who had become followers of Jesus. But Luke picked out these three stories <clears throat> to help us understand the kinds of people that we are to look for. And by supernatural vision, God will bring us tenderhearted people. And we'll just introduce them. We'll say, would you like to receive Jesus? And they say, yes, that resonates with me. Have an expectation. Have an expectation that people will receive the message. And then have an expectation that you'll meet demonized people. The gatherers, the man from gatherer, people who can't mm -hmm. escape without somebody knowing how to take authority over the demons in them. If I go overseas and uh, listen, demons don't, I don't look for demons, but demons look for me. <laughs> when you carry an anointing, Jesus didn't look for demons. Demons look for Jesus. And when you carry an anointing, demons will look for you. And you set them free. And then you'll meet the terrorist. And you have something he doesn't have. You have something in your spirit that all terrorists are looking for meaning, purpose, direction in life, and you're carrying it, and God wants you to impart to people. Uh, in Amen. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17, brothers, join in imitating me. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Your pastor's given you example. I've given you examples tonight by story after story of trusting Jesus, releasing his power, walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. I was preaching in a town, uh, and a man said, I won't accept your God. He punched the back wall of the church. Five minutes later, he was on his knees in the front of the church, asking Jesus to forgive him for his sins. He was attracted to the power of the Holy Spirit. And people can punch the wall. They can even punch you. But the anointing that you carry will cause people to come down and say, I need what you have. And so he received Jesus as his savior. Now, dear ones, today I've been in a dark place, but Jesus has been with me. What you don't know is before the first message I preached this morning, I found out that our African director for Apostolic International Network was murdered last night as he got out of his car. I assumed it was a joke. I thought it was a hoax. But after the two morning sessions were over, I made the phone calls necessary to find out if it was really true. I want to honor Pastor 
Mandla Ndova from South Africa, who was murdered last night for his witness for Jesus. In that dark hour, Jesus was with him. And I've written to many people this afternoon who know I'm preaching right now, who are praying for you and praying for me to deliver this message with power and anointing. And to say to you that in the darkness, you can praise Jesus. In the darkness, you can lift mm. up his name. and He will help you and he will bless you. In the course of my travels, three people now who have been colleagues of mine have given their life for Jesus. And every one of their spouses have stood up and said, I forgive those who killed my husband. We want to say whether by life or by death, our lives will glorify God. I'm not trying to scare you tonight. I'm just trying to say you never know when you're going to have a last conversation. Pastor Mendel and I had an extended conversation on Monday night about some topic in the scripture that just thrilled his heart. I said, Pastor, am I wasting your time? He said, no, please say more. And now, of course, I wished I'd said more and more and more. We'll go up from this conference when it's over, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, determined not to lose an opportunity to touch somebody whose heart is open for the gospel, to touch somebody who is tormented, set them free from addictions, from alcohol, from uh, sexual behavior that's perverted, and, and from things that are hurting people, and to find people who are looking for the real cause in life to fight for, the terrorists, the tough-minded people, to say, what do you know that I don't know? What do you know about Jesus? Oh, thank you, Lord. I will take a few moments and pray over you. Thank you, Lord, for the blessing of being a part of this conference, encouraging people tonight. Just stand in his presence. Let me just look down and see you. I can see you. Just stand in his presence. As you stand in his presence, let me pray for you, Pastor. Call your worship team and be there to pray for people. Come down to the front. Come down to the front of the congregation right now. Come as close as you can to the stage. Maybe there's some worship going on right now. You need healing. We release healing into your life. I didn't call your disease. Doesn't mean Jesus doesn't want to heal it. Heart disease, go now in Jesus' name. You have problems with your brain. Some people can hardly read because you have some brain problems. I didn't. I graduated from college and high school without reading until God touched my brain. I release a touch on your brain, right side and left side. Function normally. Function better than you've ever functioned before. Thank you, Jesus. You've got some eye problems. I prayed for a boy in the middle of a service. He, I was preaching on healing, and he raised his hand, and he said, I'd like to see with my left eye. He was born with a partial cornea. I'm telling you, that's a lot of pressure when a young boy will interrupt a pastor preaching and say, I want to be healed. We prayed for that young boy three times. There was no change in his sight. What do you do? And I asked for a few prophetic words. People said he will receive it. God will touch him. Six months later, I was telling that story in America. My phone rang. The little boy's eye opened six months later. I command your eye to open right now. I command your partial cornea to be healed in the name of Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, touch people, heal people. We yield Amen. our lives to Amen. use you. Give us supernatural vision to build supernatural churches with supernatural harvesting, seeing in people what only you can see. Thank you, God. We bless you. Magnify your name tonight. Pastor, maybe I should just put it in your hands. If you're watching in the network, thank you so much for watching us tonight. We release a blessing across the network, 12,000 partners. May God use this message in your life to spread the message of Jesus in further and greater places than you ever thought possible. God bless you, Pastor. <laughs>